First Baptist Church. So glad you're joining us. We've got a full house this morning. Let's all stand together. Page 28 in your hymn books if you want to use it. How great thou art, oh Lord my God. start out our Sunday together. Let's pray together as we begin. Father, we are thankful that we can gather to worship you, to rem be reminded that you're, <clears throat> you're bigger than all of creation, and that we can worship you and trust you and have salvation and a relationship with you through uh, the provision of Christ. We pray that you'd help us to uh, look to you and your word together, that you'd teach us through our time and even through the singing and music and uh, also all the young people in different classes uh, right now and even later today. We just pray for your blessing. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated.
certainly does deserve our worship and our praise. Let's all stand together. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Our great Savior. Sing it strong this morning.
sanctified, salvation wrought. Thy blood hath pardoned, part for me, and glorified I too shall be. Beautiful. You may be seated. <clears throat> Amen. Good singing this morning. Well, some time ago, Pastor was asked if he would be a part of some special services uh, at a church, and so he's traveling doing that. You can keep him in prayer, if you would, for those services uh, as well. Uh, we're looking forward to a few things, though, this uh, today, several services, but tonight, all the teenagers and all the adults are invited to be in here, so instead of the different classes, uh, Pastor's brother, uh, our, one of our missionaries in Africa, Keith Stensis, and his wife Sally are here, and they're going to be teaching the class at 6 p.m. here in this auditorium. So I want to encourage all the teenagers and all the other adults to be a part of that. The other classes uh, will continue to take place as normally. Uh, in two weeks, on Sunday night in two weeks, is going to be on the 20th, recruitment night. So we're going to be having a service here in the auditorium at 6 p.m. And this is an opportunity to learn about the different ministries and how you might fit into some of the ministries here at First Baptist Church. So I really encourage you to be a part uh, of that as well. And then we will have an announcement video that will go over some things, but I did want to mention two things. One is... Uh, Today is the last day to sign up for the marriage retreat. And so uh, in March, we're going to be having a marriage retreat where we, we have a hotel and a conference room, and uh, the Youngs are going to be there speaking, Dave and Bethley Young. And you're really going to enjoy that. They're a great couple, a lot of wisdom, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, but if you would, sign up today. If you haven't already, just go on to fbceaton.com, uh, and then there's a place to register. The cost for the whole thing, if you're going to stay at the hotel and come to the event, is $150. <clears throat> you don't have to pay the whole amount today. If you register, you can just go on there and I think you can pay $50 and uh, reserve that. But we need to be able to uh, reserve everything and make sure that's uh, all ready to go. So keep that in mind if you would to sign up for that event. And then after the service this morning, the kindergarten class has something for every member of our Wiser Society. So if you're 50 years old or above, um, there is something for you in the lobby. The kindergarten class will have something for you. And just want to mention that because I don't think there's enough for everybody. So 50 and older, uh, they have something for you to keep in mind. We'll go ahead and have the ushers come for the offering this morning. And we'll also have a brass group uh, that will play for us if they want to come uh, get ready for that. Um, one other thing to mention, uh, there will be uh, a brief meeting after the service this morning for the teens and parents um, Brother Jake, a meeting for the parents of teenagers about some things coming up, uh, another event taking place coming up pretty soon. Brother uh, Greg, would you mind coming and leading us in prayer for our offering this morning? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we consider it a privilege once again to be in your house as we, as we gather together as, as believers. We just pray, Father, that you allow the Spirit to work through each one of us. We pray for the preacher. Pray the Lord Spirit to work through him and the message is, as it comes. We just pray that it would be received, re-received. Father, just pray that it would be uh, obedient to it and, and heed the message and just follow, just follow it. As we uh, take up this offering, we follow, uh, follow, we pray that you bless both the gift and the giver. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>
Amen. <clears throat> Enjoy playing uh, with, uh, with these guys and their willingness to, to play and practice. I'd like to invite you to take your Bibles, if you would please, and join me in the book of first in <clears throat> the book of John, chapter number one. We're going to be continuing the series that Pastor began several weeks ago on who Jesus is. Uh, from this particular chapter, if you rec- as you recall, the theme for our year uh, is he is greater than I, and that comes from this book, the book of John. In chapter 3 and verse number 30, we have uh, an event that takes place where John the Baptist is, has a lot of attention and people are listening to him coming to be baptized, and he's actually had many disciples that have begun to follow him. This is John. And some come to him and, and mention that there's someone else, Jesus. He's come, and a lot of people are now following Jesus, and he's gathering disciples and almost as if he should be aware of the competition. And John replies something very insightful. He says about Jesus, he must increase, but I must decrease. And that thought is very important and profound for each of us as a Christian to keep in our hearts that it's really about him. He's the Savior, not us. And so we're going to continue, though, learning about who Jesus is uh, in the book of John, chapter number 1, and I'd like to read beginning, beginning in verse number 19, if you'll join me there. <clears throat> and this is the record of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? He saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? He answered, No. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an answer to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And they which were sent were of the Pharisees. And they said unto him, and and asked him, Why baptizest thou then, if thou be not that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water. But there standeth one among you, whom ye know not. He it is, who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. These things were done in Bethabara behind, beyond Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode on him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizes with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Again, the next day, after John stood, and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walketh, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we are thankful for the testimony of your word, how it describes who you are and what you came to accomplish. I pray, Lord, that as we look to your word, that you teach us through your spirit, help us to Follow in the footsteps of John who understood so clearly who you were and what you came to accomplish. Help us to follow you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, one Sunday morning, there was a little boy standing at the back of the church. And for the very first time, he noticed a beautiful plaque filled with names. And he stood there staring at it for several minutes before he caught the arm of a man standing nearby. And he asked him, he said, who are all these people? The man came over and he said, those are the names of all the brave men who died in the service. The little boy was silent for a moment before he 
asked with a little bit of tremble in his voice, was it in the first service or the second service? <laughs> well, we survived the first service. And I am thankful for the opportunity to continue the series that Pastor began uh, in this particular chapter, looking at the different ways John introduces Jesus to us. The Gospel of John is unique in some different ways from the other Gospels. All four Gospel records of Jesus work together in harmony to give us a full picture of Jesus, who He was, what He came to accomplish, of course, His death and resurrection and, and all of that. But the other three Gospels, they seem to especially emphasize the things that Jesus did, His miracles and uh, the way He moved and the way He traveled and also uh, the parables that He taught. He taught many different lessons and used the parables in particular in His sermons. John focuses less on what Jesus did or even what Jesus said in His sermons, and he emphasizes the answer to the question, who is Jesus? Who Jesus actually is and was? John introduces Jesus by several names and descriptions. Instead of a baby laid in a manger from Mary and Joseph or wise men or shepherds or any of those things, he simply begins by describing Jesus as the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He goes on to describe Jesus as life, and of course, before you get very far in John at all, we understand that in Him is eternal life. He describes him as the light, the true light, that which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And also, as we read, the Son of God. And what we see when we're reading the passage that we did this morning, that John continues to describe Jesus and actually describes him now as, in verse 29 and also in verse number 36, Behold the Lamb of God, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. If you'll keep three thoughts in mind this morning, I think it'll be helpful just as we work our way through this passage. And these are, are simply these, a voice, a lion, and a lamb. And let's look at the voice first. In verse number 19, it says this, and this is the record of John. And you may have noticed that there are two different Johns that, are, that, are, that we're talking about here. There's John the Apostle, uh, who is the writer of this gospel record, and he'll also write the book of Revelation. And he was one of the disciples of Jesus. He's very close to Jesus. He uh, walked with him in his earthly ministry and, and, uh, and ended up being a great leader in the church uh, after the death and resurrection of the Lord. There was also John the Baptist. So John the Apostle, the writer, and John the Baptist. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. His mother was Elizabeth, who is the cousin of Mary. His parents only had one child, and they were older, and that was John. And John was just as unique. John the Baptist was just as unique as John the Apostle. Uh, Mark describes him as having a coat of camel's hair and ate locusts and wild honey. And as I mentioned this morning, he was one of these health food guys. You can't get more organic than uh, locusts and wild honey. He made his home in the wilderness. His pulpit was a rock stuck out somewhere. And, and as he would preach, many crowds began to follow after him. Uh, they would come and be baptized, in, uh, representing their repentance and their longing to be cleansed. And, of course, preparing them to look forward to, uh, the, to the Messiah coming. Uh, there were disciples who followed him, and even though John never uh, performed a miracle, there is a very special purpose for him. It comes in verse number 6 of chapter 1. We see that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. And so as John is preaching and he's in the wilderness and he looks a little bit strange and crowds are beginning to follow him and the news spreads into Jerusalem, the leaders there send out a formal delegation to go find out who this John character was. Now, the Jewish people were looking for prophecy to be fulfilled. They were looking for a prophet. They hadn't had a prophet in, in many, uh, really hundreds of years, and uh, they were looking for some of these uh, prophets that were being uh, prophesied in the Old Testament. And so they send a formal delegation, and they ask in verse number 19, who are you, John? We know you're John, but who actually are you? And in verse number 20, he explains very clearly, he says, I'm not, if you're looking for the Messiah, if you're looking for Christ, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then, art thou Elias or Elijah? And he saith, I am not. 
Art thou that prophet? And this is evidently a reference to a prophet described in Deuteronomy who will later be filled, fulfilled actually in Christ, but they're asking if he's that particular prophet there, and he answered no. Then they said unto him, Who art thou? Which was a great question to ask. They had failed the multiple choice matching part of this already. We don't know who you are. Who in the world are you? You're, you're significant. There's some sort of specialness or anointing to your message. Who in the world are you? Are you? And the way he describes himself is very profound in verse number 23. And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. I don't know how you or I would have responded if someone just happened to come up to us and say, all right, who are you? What, we know your name, but actually, who, who, who are you? What, what, what are you all about? John could have answered this in different ways. He could have talked about the fact that his dad was a priest and uh, an angel had appeared and uh, wasn't able to talk for all the months it was until he was born and, and, uh, and how he had an interesting upbringing and how he's related to, to Jesus. But he, he chooses to explain that he's simply, he's simply a voice. I am someone who is, who's explaining or speaking not about myself. It's really not about me at all. I'm simply a voice communicating something about someone else. And so just like John the Baptist is a voice, he's saying, I'm not the, the word. It's just like John the Apostle, who's the writer. They're both simply voices, proclaiming the word, the true word of God. They're pointing like a sign, not to themselves, but if they get any attention at all, it's so that they can point people to Christ. John the Baptist's identity was clear. He knew for a matter of fact that he was not anyone's savior. He had a lot of people who would listen to him. He had a good message. He was able to call people to repentance. Many were baptized and there were disciples following him. But even as fulfilling this role as a prophet uh, at this time, he was not the Savior. He was a voice telling people about the Savior. It's important for us to, to know that about ourselves. You know, we can't even be our own Savior, much less the Savior of anyone else. We Together as a Christians around the world and generation after generation, we're simply pointing one another to the true Savior. Knowing who we are may just well be the first step to usefulness with God. We know that Peter and John, after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus, and as Peter's preaching and, and, and John are there in the temple one day, we read in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 that, that Peter preaches and he makes it very clear. He says about Jesus, there is salvation, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. All of us are pointing to Christ. His identity was clear. He understood who he was and his purpose was apparent. His purpose was, as a voice, to make straight the way of the Lord. And uh, it's like a plow in the middle of the blizzard going you know, on the road ahead of you. And you don't want to follow too close, I guess, because of the salt. But it pushes everything away and prepares the way for, for people now to be able to travel safely. And he, he, his job, his whole mission in life was to be a voice telling people about Jesus, preparing the way, making room for Jesus to come on the scene as uh, he's preparing this way for the Lord. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn or read with me from Matthew chapter 11, and we'll, we'll notice something interesting about John, because John's life is going to be uh, very unique in a few ways. John will never get married. <clears throat> uh, we don't know of John ever going to rabbi school or sitting at the feet of Gamaliel like Paul did. John is going to have a profound ministry for just a little while, and then he's going to be arrested. His head is going to be removed unceremoniously, and he's going to disappear. No longer will he have any disciples to follow him or crowds to follow him. It's going to be very strange. And in Matthew chapter 11, John has an interesting question in verse number 2. When John had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Jesus, art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? I don't know if John fully expected to, in the heights of the ministry, the heights of his preaching ministry, and all the, all the things, good things that are happening, to all of a sudden be placed in prison and no longer be able to preach. 
Verse number four, Jesus answered and said unto them, go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. The lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken in the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in the king's houses. But what went ye out to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. You see, John never performed any miracles. He lived a relatively short life. Never got married or had children or grandchildren. Those were all good things. But for him, it wasn't his ministry. It wasn't his purpose to do any of those things. It was simply to point people to Christ and then decrease, get out of the way. And in his short ministry, John the Baptist was able to point people to Christ, accomplish all of that to the point where Jesus commends him in a remarkable way about John the Baptist. John the Baptist knew his purpose, and his purpose was to lift up Christ, not himself. And we also notice his worship was, was pure. Worship is what we value most. It's what we set our hopes on. It's what we glory in. It's what has the most meaning to us. And for many people, uh, these things can be uh, characterized as maybe power or security or uh, material things that, that give us comfort or, or, or safety. Maybe respect or admiration, maybe friends or family or opinions or whatever it may be. <clears throat> but, jo but John, we know, worshiped Jesus. And one of the reasons we can conclude that is from verse number 35 in chapter number 1, <clears throat> in verse 36 and 7. We see again that John stands and there's two of his disciples there. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Here, two of John's disciples, when he tells them about Jesus, they leave John, and they go and they follow the Lamb that taketh away the sins of the world. John, you might say, you're losing your disciples. You're losing uh, the people who are following you. And, and for John, he would just simply say, they weren't mine to begin with. This is about the Lord. I'm gaining two disciples because they're following the one they're supposed to be following. In verse 27, he had already mentioned that. He said, he it is about Jesus who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoe latchet I am not worthy to unloose. I've read that at that particular time, there were rabbis who would travel around and there were disciples who'd follow or be students of a particular teacher. And you could ask your disciples to do a lot of things for you. They might carry your messenger bag or your laptop. I don't know all that they carried around in that day, but they could do all sorts of errands for you. But one thing that was just a low thing, something that you either did yourself or only had the lowliest servant or slave do was to, to, was to untie your sandals and deal with that. It was just, a, in that culture, just something that respectable people, you didn't ask someone to do that and you probably wouldn't be willing to do that for anyone else. And for John to say that would have been very striking to the people who heard it. You know, I'm not even worthy to, to, to untie his, his sandals. He's preferred above me. He represents that verse in, Mal, in Micah chapter 6 and verse 8 about how we should live as, as believers. Uh, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. His worship was, was pure. It makes us, me, me wonder, you know, if, if people come to us and they ask, what, what's your opinions about all of this? Uh, who are you? What is your purpose in, in all of this in life? How we would respond. For John, it was very clear. I'm here 
to point to Christ. I'm here as a sign to, to point people to Christ. I'm here, I'm here as a voice. And, and both Johns understood that. John the writer, as he's uh, recording this and followed Jesus and John the Baptist. And so we have a voice. And, and, and now look, let's look at the lion in verse 26. <clears throat> And John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there standeth one among you whom ye know not. You may have noticed that there isn't a lion in that verse. And if you'll allow me a little bit of creative license, I I think this might be what's going on. You know, John is noting that there is someone among you who you don't recognize. And I think maybe the reason why they didn't recognize Jesus and why eventually the Pharisees will take Jesus and they'll cry, crucify, crucify him, and and, and they'll treat him in that way, is they were looking for something a little different than the way Jesus appeared. Of course, they they weren't really looking for Jesus to be born in a stable and laid in a manger and shepherds to be the the first to come welcome him into the world. And, And they weren't really looking for Jesus to come as a lamb. They were looking for a lion. They had anticipated, as the Bible mentioned and foretold, that uh, one day the Roman oppression and the Greek oppression and the Persian oppression and the Assyrian oppression, and, and there would be a mighty king who would come and break all of those bands and bring peace and prosperity back to Jerusalem. They remembered David and his mighty men and killing Goliath, and they had remembered reading about Solomon in this beautiful temple, and they were looking for that glory to come to them as a people. And that wasn't all bad. In Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 6, we read this sometimes in December. And I'll just read it now as they would have read. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So they were looking, I think, for a lion. They were looking for this mighty general or leader to come and and, and bring glory to their kingdom. But what they got was an enigma. They got what John described, behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. They were looking for a lion, but what they didn't realize is they needed a lamb. They no doubt had recognized the cruelty of the Romans and the problems with the pagan worship and all that went along with it, but what they struggled with was acknowledging their own sin. John already kind of pointed on that when the Pharisees came and he said, oh, generation of vipers, who's warned thee to flee the wrath to come? They were looking for a lion, but what they needed was the lamb. They didn't realize that if the Messiah was going to come into judgment, the whole world would be condemned, including them. That's what Romans explains. In Romans chapter 1, it talks about that secular pagan world, how they're not thankful and how they they do all of these sins and and, and how they make gods of the creatures and of the plants and of of all these different uh, material things. But then it goes on to say that even the the good men, the the moral people, the the people who had the law, even the Jews, and, and they had Moses and the commandments, and biologically they might have even been, they were related to Abraham, but But the whole world was guilty before God, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In just a few chapters, in John chapter 3 and verse 16, we'll read, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For He came into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. They were looking for a lion, and they didn't recognize Jesus They needed a lamb. Well, we see the lamb in verse 29, don't we? The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he saith, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The expression, the Lamb of God, would have been something familiar to the Jewish hearers. 
Um, lambs had been slain for generation after generation, a, a lot of them, tens of thousands. They were very familiar with a, a lamb being selected and, and some being rejected if they weren't uh, physically well and they weren't, they weren't a spotless lamb as the Bible describes. There were many ceremonies that went along with that and blood was placed in the Holy of Holies once a year on the Day of Atonement from a, a bull that would have been sacrificed. But there's probably two primary things that would have come up in their mind when they heard John say, the Lamb of God. The first would have been a man named Abraham and his son Isaac. Abraham was someone whom God made a covenant with and said, through you I'm going to fulfill these promises. I'm going to, through you and your seed, all the nations of the world will be blessed. And he said, you're actually going to have a son. And this son promise was remarkable because Abraham and Sarah just continued to get older and it wasn't until they were quite old that they did have their son Isaac. And no doubt Abraham loved his son dearly, and this son was the one to whom all the promises were going to be fulfilled through him. And God comes to Abraham and says, I want you to sacrifice your only son Isaac now to me. And Abraham goes ahead and he gets the wood and he gets a, a fire, uh, he gets uh, a donkey, he gets some servants and he heads off into a mountain and they go up the mountain and he leaves behind the donkey and the servants and he's headed up with Isaac and Isaac asks the question in Genesis 22, he says unto Abraham his father, my father, and he said, here am I, my son, and he said, behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? I see we have everything we need except we don't have something to sacrifice. And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went, both of them, together. And you can read how that completes itself, but the reality is when they do arrive and that sacrifice is prepared, that God does put a ram in a thicket and God provides a lamb, but, but that lamb would continue to be sacrificed year after year as the Jewish history would unfold. But it was a test of Abraham's faith. What sort of sacrifice would be worthy? Well, it's your son, your, your promised son. And it wouldn't be until God himself would send his son where he'd provide that lamb. But that story, no doubt, would have, no doubt would have come into their mind. And then the other one would have been what, we call, what they call the Passover. And this took place when the nation of Israel was getting ready to leave Egypt. They were in bondage and the Egyptians uh, were a pagan society. They had all these gods they worshipped and you had the, uh, Moses and he, 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 a whole uh, thing goes, uh, takes place between Pharaoh and, and uh, God is showing himself strong and now they're prepared to leave Egypt and that night they're, they're going to prepare to leave. Um, God says, I want you to take a lamb, every family to take a lamb and, and you're going to prepare a meal and you're going to take a, a lamb, a, a spotless lamb and you're going to kill it and you're going to take the blood and you're going to put it on the on the doorpost and on the sides of the door and uh, the angel is going to pass over and judge every family but if you have the blood you won't be judged and the Egyptians who didn't uh, follow that edict the firstborn of every family died sort of as a representation of that family can read that account, but those who have the blood uh, would have been, were saved, and uh, God uh, brought the, the, the Israelites out of Egypt. And we, you can read that in Exodus chapter number 12, but uh, they continued to observe the Passover as God had commanded year after year after year for hundreds and hundreds of years. Tens of thousands of lambs were slain, sacrificed. Every year the Passover was celebrated. Well, there was one Passover that took place where things were just a little bit different. In Matthew chapter 26, we have Jesus, the night he's going to be betrayed. Within hours, he'll be crucified. And in Matthew chapter 26, in verse 26, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. What takes place here is Jesus becomes the Passover lamb. This is my body broken for you. The cup that you drink, this is my blood shed for you. Christ, our Passover, sacrificed for us. And if you'll be patient with me this morning, there's some extra scriptures that, I, that we can look at together. And I'd also like to look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 1. 
And we see here how Hebrews describes exactly how this all fits together, this lamb prophesied in the Old Testament or, or typified in Abraham and in the Passover and now what it means for Jesus to be the Lamb of God. Hebrews chapter 10 begins, for the law, these ceremonies, all these things that took place, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? Because the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. So we see here that all of those times and places and ceremonies and priestly systems and all those things that those animals shed their blood it was a picture and so i can just imagine a family comes with their lamb and they come and they bring it to the the temple they bring it to the priests and they offer that lamb and the lamb is sacrificed and the the little boy asks his dad what what is all this about and dad explains well we're making a sacrifice for our our sin there's atonement that needs to be made but we're really looking forward to how god is somehow going to provide redemption Somehow he's going to, to forgive our sin and show mercy. And, and, and we're doing this in faith of what God has promised in his provision. And that takes place in Jesus. In Hebrews 10, 11, it says, Every priest standing daily ministering and offering sometimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. True atonement never took place in the lambs of the Old Testament or all those things that we read about. They simply pointed to the Lamb of God, which would take away the sin of the world. We're reminded in Isaiah chapter 53 about this whole concept. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so openeth he not his mouth. It's as if Jesus is uh, saying when he, when he makes atonement for our sin once and for all, when all of these pictures are, are, are actually come reality in Christ, it's, it's as if he's looking at us and he's saying, I will take your sin and give you my righteousness. Are there any takers? Anybody who will look or behold the Lamb of God, trust in Him and receive forgiveness. That's what we sing about in that song, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me, for the dear Lamb of God left His glory above to bear it on dark Calvary. I'll cherish the old rugged cross. One other scripture I'd like you to turn to, if you would, is in Revelation chapter 7. So John the writer, the apostle, talks a great deal about who Jesus is in his gospel account. That's what he's presenting. But when he writes Revelation, it's interesting. We see Jesus with more of a lion uh, a sense in that he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. And we know that it's fulfilled, that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But interestingly enough, he still refers to Jesus as the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 7 and verse number 9, after this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, and worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing, and glory, and wisdom, and thanksgiving, and honor, and power, and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence come they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which come out of the great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. 
Neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them unto the living fountain of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. We have a picture of the lamb lifted up now and peace coming and and him accomplishing all that he promised to accomplish. But what they wanted, what they were looking for, what we may be looking for is a lion. But first we need the lamb. Someone once said about the world, if our greatest need had been information, God would have sent an educator. If our greatest need had been technology, God would have sent us a scientist. If our greatest need had been money, God would have sent us an economist. But since our greatest need was forgiveness, God sent us a Savior. We need to keep in mind, don't we, that we may be looking for all of these different things to bring peace to our our, our world. But I've lived long enough to survive a few election cycles, and it seems like we still quite haven't figured out the healthcare system or the education system or societal problems or families or the Drug issues or alcoholism or global issues are still always a current out there. The real need, the the fundamental need, all those other things are important, but the, the greatest need our world has is a lamb that takes away the sin of the world. So a few thoughts as we close. First of all, keep in mind, if you would, that we can't be a savior. Like John, we have to know who we are and really who we are as a humanity, as people. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. We have to look beyond ourselves and even beyond our institutions to the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. We can't be a Savior. I can't be my own Savior. I can't be your Savior. But we can be a voice. We can be like the writer John or like the John the Baptist. We can tell people about the Word or about the light. We can be salt and light telling people about the true light. We can be a voice that tells people about the, the gospel of salvation, the, the redemption that is found in Christ. But the question is, is it okay to decrease so that He can increase? Is it okay for, for us to be like if you've ever been in a crowded place and you see someone looking at you and waving? And you like that, right? It's like meeting your puppy dog when you come home. They're glad to see you. And so you, you wave back at them and then you realize they're actually looking at someone behind you. You feel like an idiot. Is it okay for us to, to, to be fulfilling our mission and, and fulfill the meaning for our life, but let it really be about Christ and, and not, about, not about us? Can we be like Paul who found contentment in his weakness when he found that even in his weakness, God's power could be most clearly seen and he could accomplish the most in Paul's frailties? It's good to be reminded that the world's greatest need isn't found in a lion or a donkey or an elephant, but in the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The sacrifice of the Lamb of God alone has the capacity to forgive every sin, the sin of the world. It's an incredible thought that every creature who's ever been born, every human who's ever been born and and the enormity of brokenness and sin that exists, that God, through the sacrifice of His Lamb on the cross, can take away that sin and condemnation. That there's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. What the Lamb of God accomplished was big enough to take the sin of the whole world. And so let's follow the Lamb. One day He will rule rule and reign. One day He will come back in triumph and glory. He will come back as the lion that He is. He will fulfill all the promises. He will defeat sin and the devil and Satan. He will set up His kingdom for for eternity. And we we, we look forward to that day, but right now we we follow Him. We find ourselves at peace with God through redemption, through faith, and what the Lamb accomplished on the cross. And we, we, we give the gospel to others. He is greater because he is the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would help us to clearly see who we are. That no matter what we may hope to accomplish or have accomplished that 
We're, we're all lost without a Savior. That we're all sinners in need of a Savior. And I pray, Lord, that you help us to see Jesus for who he is. As the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. I pray, Lord, if there is anyone here this morning who doesn't have peace with you, that they may just acknowledge sin and acknowledge that the need is there for a Savior and just with a repentant heart and honest heart cast ourselves in trust and faith in what was accomplished when the Lamb of God was offered on the cross and trust in the atonement made in His blood. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have the right perspective as we seek to live our lives as Christians, that our lives wouldn't be about our own opinions, our own path or attention for ourselves, but we would truly be eager to point people to Christ. I pray, Lord, that you'd give us wisdom to live our lives each day in, in that way, to be a witness to those around us and to follow you the way we have exemplified uh, through John. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Keep your heads bowed and eyes closed if you would for a moment. In just a moment we'll have the piano play and this is just an opportunity for you to spend a few moments in the Lord with the Lord in prayer. But I would ask you a couple questions. The first is, do you know Christ as the Lamb? Have you made peace with God through faith in Christ? God Love the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This isn't just about the Jews. This isn't just about the pagan people. This is about you and me and the whole world. So that if we'll simply behold the lamb, we can look and live. I encourage you, if you don't have peace with God, to give your heart to him. And then for the second question, am I prepared to let go of anything that might be in my life that would hold me back from, from worshiping Christ the way John did, allowing him to increase and me to decrease, being reminded that we have to look beyond ourselves to a true Savior, and we need to point our neighbors and loved ones not to ourselves but to him. As a piano place, I invite you to stand to your feet. There's a place to come kneel and pray. Just spend a few moments with the Lord in prayer. Amen. <clears throat> you may be seated. And as we look ahead at some of the things going on today and uh, this, upcoming, uh, this upcoming week and month, we'll go ahead and have an announcement video. Hi there, everyone. My name is Megan Stensis. We're so grateful you chose to spend part of your weekend with us. Let me take a moment and fill you in on a few things that you need to know about here at First Baptist Church. If you're new with us today, we're so glad to have you here. For us, church is so much more than just a Sunday service, and we want you to know that there's a place for you at First Baptist Church. One of the best ways you can get connected with us is to fill out one of our connection cards. 
take that card and fill out as much information as you feel comfortable sharing. After we dismiss, give that card to one of our ushers or to Pastor Andrew on your way out. We're looking forward to connecting with you and answering any questions you might have about FBC. Our teens are excited to be going to Valley's Edge in New Paris for their snow tubing activity. The group will be leaving the church this Saturday at 1 p.m. and will be returning around 7 p.m. The cost is $20 per teen and lunch will be provided as well. Go to fbceaton.com to pay and register and if you have any questions about the activity or would like your teen to join in on the fun, speak to Leanna Naus or Rachel Stensis. Also this Saturday, if you are 50 years and above, the Wiser Society will be having a chilly night here at the church February 19th at 4.30 p.m. If you would like more information about this activity, speak to Leah Euler or Becky Brookshire. Next Sunday at 6 p.m., we will be having our ministry recruitment night. If you're new to First Baptist or have been here a while, this is going to be an exciting time to hear about ministry opportunities from several different ministry leaders, and everyone will have the chance to see the different areas you can be involved in. We hope you'll attend this unique service to find your place at FBC. Our marriage retreat is coming up, and we would like to extend an invitation for you and your spouse to attend. Our guest speaker will be evangelist Dave Young and his wife, Bethley. The retreat will be on March 18th and 19th in Westchester, Ohio. The cost is $150 per couple, and you must register online by the end of today. If you have questions about the retreat, you can speak with Pastor Andrew before you leave today. After our marriage retreat, we'll be having our 2022 Spring Revival. Our special speaker will be Evangelist Scott Polly, and it will be from March 20th to the 22nd. And we hope you'll be able to attend every service. There are invitations on the table in the foyer for you to invite friends and families to attend as well. Once again, thank you so much for being here with us today. We want you to stay connected with us throughout the week. So be sure to visit us online at fbceaton.com and on Facebook and Instagram at First Baptist Church of Eaton. Don't forget about our Sunday School Hour tonight at 6 p.m. We have classes for every age group. Again, thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next time. Once again, Pastor wanted me to stress or encourage you to make sure you sign up for the marriage retreat if you're planning to come to that today. And uh, that way we can put all the plans in place uh, for that coming up in March. And then if you're in the Wiser Society, it looks like the kindergarten class is prepared to get you something before you leave this morning. And then you're going to want to come back tonight at 6 p.m. Brother Keith Stensis will be speaking uh, as, he's, as he's here back from Africa for uh, just a little bit, a little while. And all the teens and all the other adults will be in this room uh, for that this evening. We can stand together if you would, please. It's good to have um, Brother Brian and Miss Sherry back from Africa as well with us this morning. That's great. They've been uh, adventures galore there. And uh, Brother Stensis, would you mind leading us in prayer as we dismiss today?